Thank you very much. Can you hear me? That's a good start, isn't it? Okay. Well, I understand that you've had a lot of uh, different subjects this weekend, and what I'd like to try to do uh, in this short hour we have ahead of us is try to pull some of the threads together, because you tend to hear about, you know, this mystery or that mystery, and uh, it becomes hard to get a context on it. And uh, what I want to try to do is to show you today um, how some of these uh, things link together. And I'm very aware also that uh, yesterday you had a presentation from uh, Nick, Nick Pope, who's a very nice chap, but uh, as the slogan goes, I don't agree with Nick. <laughs> because Nick certainly has a view, which is of course entirely entitled to, that uh, you know, essentially conspiracy theories and uh, cover-ups don't really exist. Um, well, it would obviously be silly to say that everything's a conspiracy, uh, but equally, I think it's equally ridiculous to say that nothing is a conspiracy. And that very word, conspiracy theory, um, it's used as a term of abuse today. But in truth, let me be honest with you, I am by definition a conspiracy theorist. Uh, I spend a lot of time theorizing over conspiracies. So we need to get over that. In the same way that many centuries ago, the Quakers uh, ad adopted a word that was a term of abuse. Quaker was an abusive term. They thought, hey, hang on, if we use that term, it diffuses what people are trying to do. So likewise, hey, if somebody calls me a conspiracy theorist, so be it, because I suppose that's what I am. So let's start pulling the threads together. We heard a lot this morning about ancient mysteries, and you heard from Marcus about the mysteries of Egypt, and you heard more from Robert uh, later on, trying to look at the symbolism of what it is about these ancient cultures that still comes back to us today in the modern world. And we'll have something to say about that a little bit later on. But I'm starting here with an image of the pyramids because they're a very good example of something that we get used to. And as Marcus pointed out to you this morning, uh, the reality is we do not really understand how these things were built, why they were built, uh, and all of these many, many questions. And yet, isn't it remarkable that you put on the TV or the radio, and there are academics, pundits, telling you exactly when they were made, exactly why they were made, and, you know, how they were made. And the how, if you just take that as one example, uh, usually involves huge ramps, ramps almost as big as the pyramids themselves, with people hauling up these gigantic blocks. But, as I think was demonstrated to you this morning, the idea that that's how all of them were made really does not fit the facts. Uh, and there must have been some other explanation involved. And yet, as soon as you challenge, you challenge the standard world of Egyptology, and you are immediately classified as a pyramidiate. You know, that word they like to use. And that's, of course, not fair. And even when a French engineer, for instance, put forward the very reasonable alternative explanation that maybe uh, internal pyramids, uh, sorry, internal ramps may have been used in the pyramids, again, it was met with derision. How dare he? How dare he say such a ridiculous thing? Even though, actually, there's quite a lot going for that theory as yet another possible explanation. So these standards are a good symbol of something that we are, if you like, fobbed off with. It's like, we understand these, we know what they are, just don't ask us to prove it. And that's the problem, is having absolute proof. And that works two ways. That works for the normal, real world, and that works for the alternative world as well. You don't always get definitive proof, but you can certainly point to some very, very interesting evidence. Now, let's have a little guessing game here. Hands up, how many people recognize this? Go on, hands up, how many? Oh, not bad, maybe about 50% of you. But if I asked that question in a more sort of, shall we say, non-alternative forum, uh, most people look entirely blankly at this. And yet, that's a strange thing, because this was headline news uh, only a year or so back. And for those that don't know what this is, this appeared in the skies over Norway. 
Uh, and it's a real image. It's not a fake image. It was seen by thousands of people around Norway. And indeed, there's some very good videos on the internet you'll find. Here's another image showing you this incredible swirl in the sky. So uh, immediately there was speculation. You know, was this an extraterrestrial intervention? Was it some strange kind of natural phenomenon? Uh, or, as others said, was it nothing more than a missile going wrong? Because that's what the newspapers assured everybody the next day. They said, oh no, we've been given the official explanation. Apparently a Russian missile went off course. Now, one of the pieces of films that uh, they put out to demonstrate that this was the case uh, was this here. And now, as you can see, maybe, just maybe, this bit here might explain this bit here. But this perfect spiral? I don't think so. There's no footage on the internet anywhere showing a missile going wrong to this degree. And if it is a Russian missile going wrong, what's it doing over Norway? And why didn't it spark an international incident? Because it should have done. And for those of you that say, well, maybe it could have been a Russian missile, how then do you explain the fact that over the next few months and over the last year, a number of other sky spirals have been seen, including this one here, uh, just off of the Gold Coast uh, in Australia last year? So if that's a Russian missile, it's very off course. So you can see here that there are problems trying to explain this. But, of course, others have pointed out that, in fact, this particular Norwegian spiral, in fact, appeared very close to a base for what many of you will know of as the HARP project. The HARP, they're testing all sorts of things, military communications, but also some say uh, energy weaponry. And some people believe this might have been the testing of some kind of dubious device. Well, we can't answer what this is today, but it's a good example of how some mysteries are in our faces. They're in the newspaper, they're on the television, and yet what happens is very quickly we are reprogrammed. We are reprogrammed to think that it's nothing to consider, nothing to retain in our memories, and therefore people forget these strange things going on. So, when you look around you, you find lots of mysteries and cover-ups. And I'm just going to go through a few very obvious standard ones here to begin with. And given that we are here in Wiltshire, I thought I couldn't really not just briefly say something about these things. Now, I've been involved over the years, as many of you will know, with researching crop circles. And I'm a little bit tired with people that say, they're all man-made and we know they're man-made. Because the minute they say they know they're man-made, you say, I'm looking forward to the evidence. And guess what? That evidence never arrives. Are some man-made? Of course. Are many man-made? Very likely. Are all man-made? Every single crop formation that ever was, are they all man-made? Probably not, when you look at the evidence. And that's the problem. When people say, we know they're all man-made, Funnily enough, they will never deliver you the evidence showing that. And yet, we have, in some cases, eyewitness accounts, light seeing coming down into the fields, these incredible geometrical formations occurring within seconds in front of some people's eyes. We have biological anomalies occurring inside the plants in some of these formations. There are astonishing mathematical qualities, and yet, then when you see a man-made demonstration made for the or whatever, they can be quite good, but so often they lack the sophistication. Now, I know there's some of you here today who will be saying, this is nonsense. I know they're all man-made. Well, if that's the case, I'm looking forward to meeting you afterwards. Please deliver all the evidence. And then the debate can end. Until that moment happens, the debate will not end. But you see, what's happened is, again, that the public have been programmed not to be interested. So this is still going on year upon year, a less good year this year, but it's still going on. And yet we're told not to worry about it, that it's all a man-made joke, and so interest moves on. But of course, as some of you know, you know, most so-called paranormal phenomena gets dismissed in the same way. Here's a claimed image of a ghost of a little girl here, and another sort of standard ghost image. If you take the phenomenon of ghosts, it's quite remarkable that I think the current statistics are about one in 10 claim to have seen a ghost. One in 10, that's an enormous amount of people. 
okay? And yet you put on Radio 4 and you will be assured by the usual pundits that you hear, there's no such thing as ghosts. Uh, and instead, we elevate people like Richard Dawkins to very high levels of uh, celebrity, who will, of course, tell you there's no such thing as ghosts, there's no such thing as astrology. And by the way, God doesn't exist either. Which is odd, because in fact, when you often look at the polls, the majority of people do believe in those things. And yet, the media does not reflect this. The media gives us a completely warped version of actually how most people think. And the problem is, even in the alternative world, we begin to think that that is a true reflection of the rest of the world. But I've found in my own lecturing to many normal groups, WI, Rotary Clubs, whoever it may be, that's not the case. People are often far more open-minded than you may think. Now, the ghost phenomenon, for instance, I mean, we're not going to settle that today, but there's enough evidence from credible eyewitnesses that something's going on. Some people, of course, believe these are spirits trapped between worlds. Others think that it's some strange piece of time replaying over and over. Maybe it is a mixture of the two of these things. But just to say they don't exist or it's all in one person's mind doesn't add up. Because often, many different people will see the same ghost in the same place at completely different times, not aware that anybody else has seen the same thing. So there's more important evidence out there than is ever reflected in the media. But the idea that maybe consciousness can exist outside of the flesh is, of course, something which uh, many people uh, consider is proven by other phenomena, not least the out-of-body experience. Anybody here has ever had an out-of-body experience or believes they have? Quite a few, quite a few. Well, you're not alone. And again and again, people report these experiences, often under general anesthetics. And they're on the operating table, and suddenly it's as if they've woken up, but they're not really awake. And they can see themselves lying down there on the slab, and they're going, what's going on? and they find that they can move around as a sort of a, you know, non-physical entity. And some people report being able to float into other rooms and see what's in there, seeing things up on the top of high shelves that they certainly couldn't have seen from down there on the slab. Certain hospitals, including Southampton in England, have now been running experiments where they deliberately leave objects, unusual objects, in high places or funny little corners to see how many people come back from these claimed out-of-body experiences and can report seeing them. And guess what? It's a lot of people. But again, no, no, we're assured this is oxygen starvation to the brain. People like Susan Blackmore come along and tell you, no, no, it's all in the mind. But what does all in the mind mean? What is mind anyway? If people can see what's in another room, a phenomenon has occurred when it happens above a certain number of times, you're into interesting statistical chance territory where you have to say, well, actually, it's not chance. So I'm just trying to make the point here that we are actually surrounded by so-called paranormal phenomena that actually you cannot just explain away, and yet we are programmed to think that there's nothing to it, which is not fair when you look at the evidence. But, of course, there's other mysteries going on that are rather more physical and rather less pleasant. And, of course, one of the big ones that we've had in the last few years is the cattle mutilation phenomenon. And I say last few years, it seems to have been going on for many decades where each year thousands of cases around the world are reported of these carcasses of animals, often cattle, actually not always cattle, and they're dead, but there's no obvious sign of a struggle, there's no blood everywhere, there's no tire tracks, and yet it's almost as if certain parts of their body have been removed, almost with laser precision. Now, the sceptic view is it's just maggots eating the flesh and it just looks like that. And yet, there are so many cases where it's obvious something stranger has occurred. And of course, one of the things which is reported time and again with cattle mutilation is strange aerial phenomena, lights in the sky. Now, of course, immediately some people will say, well, it's extraterrestrials. Now, others say it's some strange military experiment going on. Although, why the military can't go and buy their own cattle, I don't know. But that's another story. So, we're left with a strange phenomenon that, that seems to be something to do with 
what is generically called, of course, UFOs. And I know many of you here are well versed in this. But, I mean, isn't it interesting that if you go to some states of America, so much of this stuff goes on. You get signs like this. And if you can't see at the back, you, you've got, you know, a picture of a cow with a flying saucer hovering over it. Now listen, it's meant as a joke, but the fact that they expect you to get the joke tells you just how common these reports now are, and that's important. So some things are mysteries because we just don't understand them, but other things seem to be mysteries because knowledge of them is withheld from us, the cover-up situation. Let's look at that, because I believe that you can show categorically that information about UFOs in particular is covered up. And, you know, let's go back to the hoary old subject of Roswell briefly, because there's no doubt that a lot of the myths and legends about UFOs began with Roswell. And what we're seeing here is, of course, the famous Roswell Daily Record reporting that the local military had captured a flying saucer. You know the story, 1947, New Mexico desert. Here's a mock-up image claiming to show what was found with the saucer and the grey alien beings. But you will also know, of course, that they said there was no such thing. There was no flying saucer. Here's Major Jesse Marcel showing to the world's press fragments of a weather balloon. That was the cover story, the weather balloon. Uh, but if you're wondering why Major Marcel is looking sheepish, he never believed this story. And to his dying day, he maintained that what he saw from the debris from Roswell, he did not believe could be human in origin. And there are other whistleblowers who, of course, have claimed the same thing. Now, this is very controversial. There have been claims and counterclaims and endless controversies. Some say they're all lying. Others say some of them are lying. We're not going to get to the truth now, after all this time about Roswell. But what's interesting is to notice how the cover story changed. Because then, a few years later, realizing weather balloons didn't quite cut it, then it changed. Then they said, it, no, it was Project Mogul, a device uh, which was detecting echoes from Soviet atomic tests. Then that changed when somebody said, ah, yes, but how does any of that explain the alien bodies? So here's a shot from the, the movie Roswell, showing what many people reported. These were taken into the local hospital at Roswell, it is alleged. Typical grey alien beings with the almond eyes, you know the drill. But, of course, suddenly it was becoming clear that the cover story didn't explain this. So then a new cover story arrived, only about 18 years or so ago, and the military said that what the alien bodies were, were crash test dummies. Now, I don't know about you, but you have to hope that doctors and nurses who claim to have seen these things can tell the difference between a body and a crash test dummy. Maybe not. So there's something strange about the whole Roswell thing. And as I say, we're not going to get to the bottom of it. But, of course, the conspiracy world contends that the craft and other retrieved craft from other incidents, by the way, were taken here. This is an aerial shot of the famous Area 51. And, of course, it's in the Nevada desert. And strange things were filmed flying over these runways as if they were testing some secret technology. Because, of course, the allegation is they are reverse engineering uh, retrieved extraterrestrial technology into modern military technology. Some say stealth technology, for instance, was based on what they originally found from ETs. But clearly they don't want us to know what's really going on. Uh, you wouldn't film anything flying over there now because they've pushed back the boundaries in recent years. That's as much as you can now see. And of course you will be arrested if you go in. But of course the minute they tell you you can't know what's going on, and they've never really said what goes on at, um, at uh, Area 51, of course that's when conspiracy theory comes along to fill the gap. And often validly so. So, I mean, you know, let's look at UFOs briefly. How many sightings do you need to prove there's a real phenomenon? Now, that doesn't prove where they're coming from. But those that say there's no such thing as UFOs they are being nonsensical. Because you have so many high-level uh, eyewitnesses. You have military personnel, commercial airline pilots, and many credible, uh, qualified citizens who see them. So let, let's forget this, do they, don't they exist? Of course they exist. Something strange flies around in our airspace. But the question is, what are they? 
Because, of course, you can say that they are extraterrestrial. Others say they are secret military projects. Maybe they are a hybrid of all of these things. But, you know, when you try to find out more, this is when it gets interesting. And, of course, people have tried to use the Freedom of Information Act to get documents released about UFOs. And the good news is, when forced, the documents do get released. But, unfortunately, that's what you then get. Now, do you need any more evidence of a cover-up? Because that is, in every literal sense of the word, a cover-up in operation. Where, um, under the um, necessities of national security, they will tell you that, uh, that you, you can't read this. But then you think, but if there's nothing going on, why do they need to cover it up? So this is, of course, where we need to turn to civilian testimony to see if we can see what really is going on. And, of course, there have been many, many claimed encounters with ETs and UFOs over the years. Here's Betty in Barney Hill, one of the earliest of the famous so-called alien abduction cases. And in 1961, in New York State, they claimed they were taken up on board a spaceship where they met beings uh, rather like this. Here's Betty years later with a model she made showing the creatures they claim they, they uh, met. Not dissimilar to all the other grey beings that we've had described over the years. Now, the problem with this is, is that, of course, it's, it's widely dismissed, of course, in the media, but then when people like John Mack, the Harvard psychiatry professor, now sadly no longer with us, when he, as a sceptic, decided to investigate alien abduction and uh, regress people using hypnosis, he was shocked to find that out of the hundreds of people that he interviewed, he realized that even when you dismiss the fantasists and the liars, actually the majority of people did believe that these experiences had occurred. And he had to conclude that whether you said they were taking place on a realm of mind or physically taking place, nonetheless you have a real phenomenon and that you need to look at the symbolism of these encounters and what is coming through the collective. Because repeated symbols, repeated themes were coming through from what people were reporting with their encounters of these beings. And this takes us on to the next stage of this presentation. Because one of the things these beings seem to like to do is to tell people what's going to happen in mankind's near future. And people like Billy Meyer and John King and Whitley Strieber have claimed they were given visions of really large, big world events, which they then wrote down. And many of them, they claim, have come true over the years. But one of the recurring themes of what these beings either say or telepathically transmit, it is alleged, is that our world is about to change enormously. And it's due to start happening about now. Now, this has been coming through for a long, long time. And, of course, that's very interesting because that resonates with a number of other messages on similar themes that have been coming through. Here we see uh, Edgar Cayce, very well-known medium and clairvoyant uh, from the early 20th century. And Cayce very accurately predicted a number of interesting events, like the Second World War, like the Wall Street crash, like the Cold War, the rise of communism. Now, he wasn't right about everything, but right about enough things to make you think he was onto something. And he was another one that said that either at the end of the 20th or the beginning of the 21st century, there will be a huge transformation of consciousness on this planet and big, earth-changing events. And, of course, psychics and mediums have been coming forward with these kinds of claims for a long, long time. And that's when you have to think maybe there is something trying to speak to us through the collective here. So you've got E.T. seemingly telling us this. You have psychic events seemingly coming through, exploring it. And, of course, we've had, in recent years, the big furore over the 2012 phenomenon. And for anybody left that doesn't know, of course, around the world, most famously the Maya, but not exclusively, Around the world, many ancient cultures have recorded this cycle of time, which is 5,125 years. And the prophecies and the predictions attached to that time cycle say that when it ends and begins again, there is transformation for the world. There is upheaval and a new era begins. Now, if anybody doesn't know, the turning of the next cycle is next year, 21st of December, 2012, the solstice at, curiously, 11.11am 11, 11 precisely. 
that mystical number that so many people get excited about. So when you then look at how many cultures had this same belief and this same time cycle, that's why you've got people expecting a huge change. Now, I think anybody expecting everything to happen on one day is probably being naive. I think it's about a time of change. I think, like many people, we're already in it. Look at recent events, the Arab uprisings, all the things going on around the world, here too, social unrest. It, the change is in the air. So I think we're already in it, and it's going to take decades. If you look at the astrology of 2012, and if you want to know more about that, speak to my partner, Helen, who studied that. Even if you forget the prophecies, the astrology of the next few years, particularly here in England, is all one about people standing up for what they believe in, standing up against oppression, standing up against false authorities. And we're going to see a lot of clashes of this in the next few years. So all of this is currently milling around in the collective, the expectation of change. But, of course, we have another source of prophecy that some people try to link in with this, and that is religious prophecy. And obviously you have the Bible, which is crammed full of things like the book of Revelation, but there are more modern religious prophecies that may have an interesting spin on this. Here, for instance, are the three children from Fatima in Portugal in 1917. And that was the um, site of one of the most famous so-called apparitions of what seemed to be the biblical Virgin Mary. Now, these three children uh, had if you like visions, but they were spoken visions too. This being said to them that they needed to give certain information to the Pope at the time, another Pope Benedict back then, curiously. And we'll talk about what that information was in a moment, but very reasonably, the children said, well, nobody is going to believe us. So the being said, fear not, if you bring as many people as you can to this place at this time, I will perform a miracle for you that will convince the world that what you're saying is true. Well, if you go to Fatima today, you'll see the cathedral window commemorating what was reported. On October the 17th, uh, uh, sorry, October the 13th, 1917, Thousands of people claim they witnessed what they believe to be the sun performing these extraordinary aerial acrobatics, throwing out colours, coming down like a falling leaf behind the horizon, back up again, very low over the people's heads. And even more extraordinarily, we even have photographs purporting at least to record the event. Here we see the people waiting. You can see how wet it was, they got the brollies up. And there even is an image which claims to be a photo showing the object. It looks like an eclipsed sun, but no eclipse was due that day. What is, I think, of real interest today is when you see the behaviour of the light and what thousands of people reported, it is very similar to what we would today call UFO activity. Now, that doesn't mean the Virgin Mary wasn't involved. I am completely religiously unbiased. I don't know but there is a connotation with UFO sightings, not least of which is that when the object made its final pass very low over people's heads, suddenly the rain stopped like that, the puddles suddenly dried up, and all the clothes that were drenched were instantly dry. And there have been many encounters with UFOs where people have claimed to have been very close, where that same drying quality, the vanishing of water, has been reported. So we seem to have a resonance here. We seem to have a connection here with what people still report today, which means, I think, that something did occur. There are too many witnesses. Now, the information that was given was the first two bits were known quite early on. One, like Edgar Cayce, was a prediction of the Second World War. Again, there was a prediction of the rise of communism and the Cold War. But the third secret was kept secret for a long time. And in fact, only about 15 years or so ago, the Vatican finally said, oh, the third secret, yes, well, that wasn't really anything much. What that was, apparently, was um, a vision of the assassination attempt on John Paul II back in 1981. And when they said that, a lot of people scratched their heads and said, are you sure that's all it was? 
because, funnily enough, a key Vatican member of staff who had spent much of his lifetime researching Fatima, speaking to surviving witnesses, and who verified it as a miracle, he had dropped very heavy hints that really the last secret was all about big, massive changes for our world due to occur about now. And who was that person? That person was this gentleman here. Cardinal Ratzinger, as was better known to you today, is the current Pope Benedict. An accident? Another Pope Benedict? Maybe not. Now, aside from all the other controversies about the church, let's just focus on this one aspect today, okay? This man believes that we are about to enter a time of massive change because he was the one that dropped the heaviest hints. And yet, funnily enough, in recent years, he's gone very, very quiet, as if he never said those things. Which means that we have a man influencing millions of lives around the world who's not telling us what he really thinks is about to occur. And of course, this has resonance with many other world leaders who have an inherent belief that we are in end times, as some people call it. Um, this is, of course, why conspiracy theorists say, well, we're not being told the truth about what's going on, on in our world by people that really should be telling us the truth. And talking of that, there is a famous person that you may recognize who also has something in common with this. This gentleman here, Mr. Bush with a halo, rather appropriately. It's not really a halo, obviously. Um, he just leaned in front of the presidential seal at a rather apt moment. Because does anybody remember here when some Palestinian officials directly challenged Mr. Bush and said, why did you invade Iraq? Does anybody remember his answer? Anyone? Well done. He said that God had told him to invade Iraq. He claimed to have been divinely inspired to have done that. Now, I don't know about you, but I have to hope that God's envoy on earth is not George W. Bush. But who knows? I don't know. But I think actually it's more likely that these visions came through, in fact, from this man here. This is the pastor Ted Haggard, a very well-known evangelical preacher in America. He is another end-timer. He believes categorically that the last judgment is going to be in our lifetimes and the rapture. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, it is a matter of fact and not conspiracy theory that every Monday morning, we're available, Haggard would have a conference telephone call with Bush and his cabinet members and would advise Bush on global policy. Now that worries some people because this is a man who believes that not only will the final battle of Armageddon, good against evil, as predicted in the book of Revelation, not only will it occur, but that it should occur, and that it is America's duty to make it occur. And here he is advising the president what to do with world policy. Is that why world peace never comes? Because that's not really what's going on. And you heard Robert Boval earlier on giving another alternative history of other motivations which may be behind all of this. But religious motivations may be a bigger part of it than perhaps you're generally given credit for in the conspiracy world. And by the way, don't think this agenda's gone away. Barack Obama has strong evangelical leanings in his background, whatever other dodgy, darker things there may be about him. And Hillary Clinton, arguably the most powerful woman in the world today, short of Angela Merkel, she is a member of the family, and they are one of the key evangelical end-time movements in America. They don't shout about it, but in other words, people who are shaping world policy that affects our lives are not only waiting for the end of the world, but are believing that it's their duty to actually bring it about. Does that scare you? It scares me. Because even Gore Vidal wrote about this 30 years ago in his book Armageddon. This is not news, but we don't look at it enough. We need to. A lot of people, especially in America, as you saw recently with, with the fake rapture, or, well, it's not fake, it's rescheduled for next month, isn't it? So we can look forward to that. You know, many people believe that they are going to be bodily lifted up into the heavens shortly before the Day of Judgment arrives. And this is, of course, a marvelous thing, and you want this to happen. But according to their own beliefs, that can't happen until you've had the Battle of Armageddon. 
Now that is a worry, because of course these people may try to set these events in motion. Now that doesn't mean that any of this is true, or that we have to believe it, but there are core religious beliefs, and people are entitled to any belief they want, but they are affecting us without our permission or consent, and that's the problem. By the way, would you like to know one more world leader who has on several occasions taken advice from the pastor Haggard? Go on, guess. Guess. Well done, Tony Blair has also been advised by Ted Haggard. Seeing the world through new eyes slightly now? So there is, I think, a number of interesting stuff that we need to research more on top of all the other standard conspiracy stuff. But of course, listen, the whole business about the conspiracy theories and new world order and one world government, do I really need to explain it? Suffice to say that many people today believe that Global events are being manipulated or even engineered to suit the needs of a small ruling elite who are dangling everybody like puppets and are trying to gather lots and lots of power into very, very few hands. And I don't believe all conspiracy theories, but I think to say that none of it is true is foolish because I think there's a lot of evidence to support this New World Order program. And of course, some say they are actually, you know, they're sponsoring wars. They are triggering terrorist atrocities. They are triggering economic crashes because it creates the mandate for this one world government, these Orwellian super states that so many people have been worrying about for so long. And of course, some see the EU as a step towards that. Others are worried about the development of the Amero, that when the dollar crashes, the Canada, Mexico, and the United States will go under one currency. And ditto, if the euro crashes, these are actually maybe uh, planned steps towards greater unification. Okay, and listen to the language. When they're talking about the euro at the moment, a number of high-level politicians have said, well, the problem is that we've got too many sovereign countries fighting for their own needs instead of working together. Listen to the language, because you can hear the New World Order plan, if you choose to believe in it, unfolding before your very eyes. And, of course, how does it work? Because you don't have to believe it, but it's important to know a lot of people do believe this. And people believe what's going on at the moment is, A, you need to create fear. We must be kept fearful, whether it be through the war on terror and terrorism, whether it be through fear of immigrants and foreigners. That's an old one. That always goes on. Uh, and, of course, recently, fear of poverty. You know, fear of no money is a big one. We are giving in to austerity measures that we would never give in to if we weren't afraid. And some say the whole economic business, as I've just said to you, is being manipulated. And whether you believe in it or not, another thing that's been used hugely to create fear is, of course, global warming. Now, if you choose to believe in global warming, fine. But even if you do, it's been completely misused to generate fear and terror and bring in more control. Because that, of course, is what this is really about. But as most of you will know, in fact, many people simply do not accept the global warming model. But let's not go into all that today. So when we're fearful, what do we do? And this is not news, many of you know this, but let's just remind ourselves. The first thing we do is give in to distraction. We beg for distractions. We fill our heads with rubbish watching the telly. We fill our bodies with rubbish and chemicals and aspartame and terrible things. We are transfixed by materialism, shopping. Nice things are offered. And the media distracts us with ridiculous stories like Freddie Star Ate My Hamster is nothing. Don't believe me? Go to Smith's tomorrow. Look at the shelves. Look at the mind rot that is being targeted at people. It's unbelievable. Try to find a decent magazine to read. You're struggling, okay? It's distraction of the worst kind. And it leaves us apathetic. It leaves us in a state of sort of mindlessness. Now, not everybody's like that, thank goodness, but too many are, and now is the time to wake them up. Because while they are fearful and they're looking for distraction, in under the covers, of course, comes the control. And as we've seen with the riots recently, you know, you've got people begging for more control. Some, of course, think the riots themselves were allowed to happen. Some say the police were deliberately held back on that first night because then they've been able to bring in all the kinds of controls we're now used to. And in the last few years, we have heavier policing in this country, more surveillance cameras than any other country in the world, even though it's not just an English problem. You know, body scanners that show you wobbly bits at airports, if you've got any wobbly bits. 
Um, because we're afraid. You don't want to be blown up on a plane, of course. So we give in to restrictions that then go beyond the call of duty. And um, health and safety, of course, has been massively abused, uh, as you well know. And then the ultimate solutions are offered. And the big one coming around the corner is, of course, microchipping. The microchipping of humanity. This is old hat to some of you, but you'd be amazed how many people are not aware that already police forces, platoons, are having microchips put in them. They're ID tags, but what else are they doing? Uh, this is a cat, by the way, with a microchip in it. We're already microchipping our pets. Um, we're all next. And of course, the problem is, that the idea is that eventually this will regulate anything. If you want to go shopping, you'll need it. If you want to go to a public space or use public transport, you'll need it. What happens if a dubious regime comes to power that doesn't like you? They could switch it off. You become a non-person. You would be a social pariah. It would make life very hard. It would be a very good way to keep you under the thumb. And, of course, if you believe it's a tracking device or even a mind control device, as some have said, you probably won't want one stuck in your arm. But this is the way the world is going. And when they're afraid, people beg for it. But this isn't new. Most of you know this man. Remember David Icke? Well, of course you remember him. But remember 20 years ago, OK? David Icke was a well-known TV presenter back then, and then, of course, he started to go public with his so-called New Age beliefs, and he started to talk about all this kind of stuff. You look back 20 years ago to what he was saying, it's uncanny. He got so much of this right, what would happen with various wars around the world, the war on terror, the microchipping, he was saying this a long time ago. Others too, of course, but Icke said it publicly, and for that was vilified and attacked, of course, as you well know. And many people still believe this man was on the ball. The problem some have, however, of course, with Ike, is that he also has extreme beliefs, which some people struggle with. And not least of the one is that his belief is that this ruling elite actually is maintained by a bloodline that's gone through the ages, which is essentially extraterrestrial in origin, which you know, some people can accept that. But what some people don't accept is that the head of the ruling elite is the British royal family, who are, in fact, shape-shifting lizards. <laughs> no, I can't say this isn't true, nor can I say it is true. But what is interesting is how many people do believe this. Um, and even if you remove the lizard element from it, there's certainly evidence that bloodlines have been maintained to maintain power over the years. We all know this. Wars have been fought uh, to keep you know, certain monarchy bloodlines in place, rich dynasties. This is important. You don't get to be who you are unless you're one of the family. And it is true. I mean, it is said that extraterrestrial genes go through all the presidents of the United States as well. But it is the case that all presidents of the United States carry uh, the same gene as the royal family. They are all direct bloodline uh, links to the British royal family. So some say you only get into a place of power if you're of the right bloodline. So you can ridicule this if you want, but then you look at the myths and legends of alien beings, that's what we would today call them, coming down from the stars, interbreeding with mankind. It's in Sumerian legends, it's in Egyptian legends, it's all over the world, and of course it's even in the Bible. And Genesis chapter 6 describes how the sons of God, who in biblical tradition were these giants that came down and interbred with human women, gave birth to the Nephilim, a hybrid race that it says clearly went on to become very influential throughout human history. So there are, in fact, many records to show that a lot of cultural beliefs have at their core the notion that we were seeded from somewhere else, okay? So that's not exclusive to conspiracy theorists, that's for sure. But interestingly, if you go just a paragraph or two away from that story, you come to the story of the Tower of Babel, where, of course, mankind was getting very advanced, and the Old Testament God didn't like this very much. So he struck down the people working on the tower with the inability to communicate with each other. And they had to stop working on the tower and go off and create their own civilizations instead. Uh, and some see this as a metaphor for the story of Atlantis, or Lemuria, or Mu. The notion that an enlightened civilization came before all others, and that the survivors of a disaster to that civilization 
seeded the civilizations that we still know today. It is a very common belief. And of course, some believe the high Egyptian culture was rooted in that. As you saw from Robert Bovell's presentation earlier on, ancient occult beliefs and signs and symbols are still held to be powerful today. Secret societies have maintained these and they're still used. And isn't it interesting, if you just take the pyramid as but one obvious symbol, how often they come back in human history? Many centuries later, um, South America, we have more pyramids, of course. And yeah, you know, the corny old eye over the pyramid. And yet, what a powerful symbol this is. So if you've got a dollar bill in your pocket, you've got a pyramid in your pocket with the illumined ones at the top. And you heard Robert's description of this earlier, which is, of course, completely right. But it also makes a more basic statement that it says plainly, we're at the top, you're down there somewhere, know your place, and all will be well. Respect your place in the pyramid. And that is quite a powerful statement, and it's said again and again through symbolism, and it's built again and again, either as an in-joke or as a kind of a message into our architecture. You were hearing also about the glass pyramid at the Louvre. Why was that put there? But never mind the Louvre, what about London? You've got a glass pyramid, bang on the top of a financial centre in Canary Wharf. And it is said that if you follow the lines of the pyramid down to the ground, it gives you the exact dimensions of the Great Pyramid of Giza. That is not a coincidence. It's a message. It's just letting you subtly know the same old knowledge still governs the world today. And of course, secret societies are very powerful. And we all know the obvious ones, you know, and you've got things like Skull and Bones at Yale University, you know, Kappa Phi Beta, all of these kinds of things, no time today. But let's just look at one, because I'm still amazed how few people seem to know about this. Maybe more of you today will, but not everybody, I'm willing to bet. This is uh, a picture from the Bohemian Club. And the Bohemian Club was a secret society founded in California in the late 1800s, but it quickly began to attract high-level politicians from around the world and became the club to be a part of. And uh, they bought some lovely woods that they christened Bohemian Grove. And once a year, they would carry out this ritual where they would sacrifice the effigy of a child to a giant stone owl, as you do. Uh, some say it's a bull, others say it's an owl. Let's call it an owl today. Uh, now, this, of course, seems like some quaint piece of Victoriana, were it not for the fact that the same ceremony still goes on today at Bohemian Grove. And you look at the roll call of people that go, your Bushes, your Blairs, your Kissingers, your Cheneys, your Nixons. Anybody who is anybody, if you're a man at least, will wind up sooner or later at Bohemian Grove. Some people think this is a very strange thing for our world leaders to be doing on their holidays, sacrificing effigies of children to giant stone owls. And of course, others accuse them of worse. Um, this is not conspiracy theory, it's real. And part of the reason we know is there's been too many whistleblowers. In fact, this man here, who is essentially a skeptic, really brought it to big public attention. But even he accepts that this is real. This is John Ronson. Guardian journalist, Channel 4 presenter, and you know, he's, he's gone more skeptical as the years have gone by. But let us not forget, he broke into the Bohemian Grove compound with Alex Jones, famous conspiracy theorist, and he filmed the ritual and he made it a, a part of his best selling book, Them. So you can read about the Bohemian Club in W.H. Smith. So it's not hidden, this information, but they, the mysterious they, they rely on you not knowing about it or not really caring enough about it to do anything with that information. They're not going to ban it because you ban it. It draws more attention, but you just don't discuss it. That's, that's the classic way of dealing with it. You simply don't discuss. So this is going on in our world. Big decisions occur here. The first meeting to discuss the development of the atomic bomb took place at Bohemian Grove, outside of democracy. People are not comfortable with this. In fact, most of the big decisions seem to be made outside of democratic principles. This is where real power lies. You know them. The Bilderberg Group, the Trilateral Commission, the Tavistock Institute, the Club of Rome, the Council of Foreign Relations. This is where real power resides. Big decisions get made here that affect our lives, and yet we have no say. We have no say. And what they decide is then filtered down to our parliaments, to our illusions of democracy. And of course, this is where people say this isn't right. 
And therefore, if we don't really know where power lies, why should we believe anything that we are ever told? Why should we believe in it? And that's where you get people, of course, questioning everything. And of course, as soon as you start to question everything, you, you'll, you'll learn how to be a fanatic just for being reasonable and saying, yeah, but these guys dress up in funny robes and worship giant owls. And they go, oh, yeah, right? And you go, yeah, right. But you're not allowed to express this in polite society. And so you get all kinds of conspiracy theories. But when you just, I'm going to take this one as an example. And there are people in this room better qualified than I to talk about it, but very briefly. What about the moon hoax theory? Okay, bless you, Marcus and Mary and David, if you're in here. You were the pioneers in this. So many people doubt the story that we went to the moon. I think at the last poll, 40% of people in America are not sure they've been told the truth about the moon landings. That's an enormous amount of people. And the problem is that there are anomalies in the record. Now, you would have seen there were photos taken from the air, well, not the air, but in orbit recently, claiming to show, you know, the footprints on the moon and all of that. But some people say until you stand there, given that Photoshop techniques are what they are, you're not really going to know if they're real or not. Because many people do not believe the evidence. I mean, you've got three pieces of evidence. The astronaut's testimony. But they could be lying, can't be sure. You've got moon rock, but that could have been retrieved by robot probes. So really all you have is the photographs. And yet there's so many anomalies. This classic shot of Buzz Aldrin is all wrong. Uh, you can see that uh, he's nicely lit up, the shadow's jet black. If there's enough reflected light to light his body up, why isn't there enough reflected light to also light the shadow? Well, that's an anomaly in a lot of these images. It's almost as if artificial light's been used to light up his body, but they claim no artificial light was taken. And others say, why is it there's such a bright spot to his side there when it falls off into shadow in the distance and shadow in the foreground? It's like a spotlight. Many people claim these were taken using spotlights in studio conditions, of course. The horizon is wrong. It's been clearly demonstrated that this horizon really ought to be through his middle because it was taken, allegedly, by Neil Armstrong, who you can see in the reflection with a camera on his chest, as indeed many of these images were taken. Uh, and as Marcus has pointed out so many times, uh, you know, how many perfect pictures are you really going to get going click, 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 click? Okay, uh, and then you come home and suddenly you've got perfect shots. Taking them like that, I really do doubt that that is possible. There are so many anomalies and I'm going to whiz through them today because we are short on time. What I just want to say here is this, that when you start to look at the fact that there isn't even any dust on the feet of the craft, and yet you look at the recent Phoenix Mars lander, which shows what you would more expect it does certainly seem as if at least some of these pictures were taken in studio conditions, okay? But I want to wish through, because there's something more important I really want to share with you. Um, by the way, if you really struggle to believe NASA would ever fake an image, look at this. Here's Michael Collins spacewalking from the Gemini craft, until somebody then later found this photograph in the NASA records of Michael Collins in a test aeroplane. It's the same image. They've cut him out, stuck him on a black background, and said, look, hey, he's in space. <laughs> Hallelujah. So we are lied to. If you want more, look at the Orlis website. Look at the Jack White studies especially, or indeed read Dark Moon or One Small Step. We're not told the truth. We know we're not told the truth about things. This happened only a couple of weeks ago, um, the fall of Tripoli. These images were transmitted claiming to be live from Green Square in Tripoli until somebody said, hang on, that's not a Libyan flag, and these people look more sort of Indian than Libyan. And people realised, oh, this is from India. There's the Indian flag, there's the Libyan flag. Spot the difference. And yet this was broadcast as live, purporting to show you what was going on in Libya. It was a distortion, it was programming to make you think Gaddafi had already had it when he hadn't. We know we're programmed, we know we're lied to. Weapons of mass destruction, need I say more? David Kelly, need I say more? If you believe David Kelly really committed suicide, for God's sake, read Norman Baker's book, The Strange Death of Dr. Kelly. Everyone knows, in the core of cause, Kelly was murdered because we needed to go to war. We needed the New World Order plans for the war on terror, Afghanistan, Iraq. I believe that Nick, Pope was saying to you yesterday there are no 
serious grounds for believing 9-11 was a conspiracy. Sorry, that is not true. There are so many good grounds for believing that we have not been told the truth of 9-11. Thank you. And to say there's no evidence is simply to blind yourself to the evidence. I'm so short on time, but you know most of it. So many anomalies, the hole in the Pentagon is just too small for a 767. Some say it was a small plane, some say it was a missile. There's no definitive evidence it was a 767. Um, this was the totally anomalous route that the plane took into the Pentagon. It should have broken up in the air. It should certainly never have behaved that way. It should have crashed before it did that curve. And yet we're told the man at the helm was Hany Hanjur. An Al-Qaeda terrorist who even the flight school that inadvertently trained him said he could not handle a light aircraft. But we've been asked to believe he did this marvel of aviation acrobatics. The Twin Towers, there's no time today. Is it true that fire and damage brought them down alone? It cannot be true. There is evidence again and again and again that explosives were used in these buildings. There's the Twin Towers compared to demolition squibs seen there. And when you start to see the film, you see these explosions going off at levels that cannot be anything to do with what's going on up here. They're falling at free, full speed. Nothing can be getting down there. No pressure wave, no air, nothing. These are explosions. People in the towers, firemen, rescue workers, said there were explosives going on inside these towers. Look how far down some of these explosions are. Serious qualified professionals are saying this is controlled demolition. And, and this last piece of footage here says it all. Look at where these explosions are. And they were going off for a long, long time before these towers came down. And of course, Building 7, where some people think 9-11 was really coordinated from, okay? They did this to it at 5.20 that day. We are told that this building collapsed down like a house of cards, a steel frame 47 building, uh, because of a fire that small. How stupid do they think we are? The BBC conspiracy farce is lying. They omitted all of the important evidence the other day. The BBC Three program is a complete joke. When they debunk 9-11 conspiracies, they only do it by omitting the key evidence, okay? And when you look at the footage of Seven coming down, again, you see explosives going off down the side there. You also have people like this, R William Rodriguez, the janitor of the North Tower. He witnessed the first explosion in the basement 30 seconds before the first plane hit. Guess what? None of that was included in the 9-11 Commission final report. There's no time, I've got probably no time, but I've got just two minutes, Malcolm, bear with me, I just want to finish. There are so many questions, for God's sake, go away and find out. Do not be fobbed off by those who say there was no conspiracy, but you have to see the evidence and read it for yourself, okay? There is so much evidence out there. If you read one book, find any book by David Ray Griffin as a starter, and you don't have to agree with all his beliefs, but his observations about 9-11 are utterly, utterly impeccable. Was Bin Laden involved with 9-11? Maybe, but if he was, absolutely. Somebody within military intelligence, traitors within America, must have helped this to be as successful as it was. And it gave them the mandate for the wars that the New World Order has long wanted. It gave them the mandate for all the controls and surveillance that we were talking about earlier on. And many of these people, when you boil it down, seem to have strong occult beliefs. Are you putting the pieces together yet? Go back to the beginning of this talk. And this is how I want to round this up. You saw that there are many prophecies and predictions that these times are times of change. Well, not only is that a change in consciousness through social shift and social unrest, there are other things that may play a part. Go and look at what NASA is saying about the sun. NASA again and again is putting out warnings. The sun is about to put out a huge solar flare. And if it happens to be headed towards us at the wrong moment, it could send us back to medieval times, bang, by knocking out the world's electrics. This is not fringe science, this is NASA saying we need to be really, really cautious of the sun. Many people believe the whole New World Order exercise of control is to make sure that if some massive event occurs, that they are ready so that the old order is not turned over. 
because they want to stay in control. And it's possible that the 2012 time cycle of the ancients was based around observing wider solar cycles and other cycles, okay? But the good news of all of this is this. Many people also believe that an electromagnetic pulse wave from the sun may be the very thing that rewrites our DNA, that raises us to that new state of consciousness that all the prophecies say will result after the initial upheaval. And there's the good news, because experiments by people like Rick Strassman and Michael Person just show when you expose the brain to electromagnetic waves, it changes our whole nature. We start to produce natural dimethyltryptamine, which of course I understand Graham Hancock was speaking here about yesterday. And if you want to know more about mind power, okay, check out the Global Consciousness Project that shows that the more people that think in a certain direction at the same time, it generates a field. It actually can change the workings of computers, which means that what we think does change the world. And that's not enough. You've got to go out there and spread the word as well about things that you're concerned about. But we have a chance here. We have an opportunity here because the world is changing anyway. And maybe if there's anything to all the things I've just discussed here, we are about to see an even bigger change. Be ready. Be ready physically, having a few bottles of water and food around just in case there is a big solar flare or an economic crash. Might be quite wise, but also be ready inside yourself and in the way that you live your lives. Because some people think that then we get through and then you become part of the solution and part of the creation of the next step of evolution and not the problem. And that is what goes before us today. And cheap advert, I can't say much to you today. I've had to rush. If you want to know more, have a look at the Truth Agenda. There's some copies at the back table there. It's on the Nexus store as well, because I've had to rush through a lot of stuff. But I hope what I've done here is draw some threads together to make you see maybe how some of this sits together. And also, so that when you go out of here today, you realize that what you've learned here this weekend can be used to make a difference. Don't waste it. Thank you very much indeed for listening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's very kind of you, thank you. That doesn't get your mind funny. I don't know what, 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 assured everybody the next day, they said, oh no, we've been given the official explanation. Apparently a Russian missile went off course. Now, one of the pieces of films that uh, they put out to demonstrate that this was the case uh, was this here. And now, as you can see, maybe, just maybe, this bit here might explain this bit here. But this perfect spiral? I don't think so. There's no footage on the internet anywhere showing a missile going wrong to this degree. And if it is a Russian missile going wrong, what's it doing over Norway? And why didn't it spark an international incident? Because it should have done. And for those of you that say, well, maybe it could have been a Russian missile, how then do you explain the fact that over the next few months and over the last year, a number of other sky spirals have been seen, uh, including this one here, uh, just off of the Gold Coast uh, in Australia last year? So if that's a Russian missile, it's very off course. So you can see here that there are problems trying to explain this. But, of course, others have pointed out that, in fact, this particular Norwegian spiral, in fact, appeared very close to a base for what many of you will know of as the HARP project. The HARP, they're testing all sorts of things, military communications, but also some say uh, energy weaponry. And some people believe this might have been the testing of some kind of dubious device. Well, we can't answer what this is today, but it's a good example of how some mysteries are in our faces. They're in the newspaper, they're on the television, and yet what happens is very quickly we are reprogrammed. We are reprogrammed to think that it's nothing to... Uh, internal pyramids, uh, sorry, internal ramps may have been used in the pyramids. Again, it was met with derision. How dare he? 
How dare he say such a ridiculous thing? Even though, actually, there's quite a lot going for that theory as yet another possible explanation. So these standards are a good symbol of something that we are, if you like, fobbed off with. It's like, we understand these, we know what they are, just don't ask us to prove it. And that's the problem, is having absolute proof. And that works two ways. That works for the normal, real world, and that works for the alternative world as well. You don't always get definitive proof, but you can certainly point to some very, very interesting evidence. Now, let's have a little guessing game here. Hands up, how many people recognize this? Go on, hands up, how many? Oh, not bad, maybe about 50% of you. But if I ask that question in a more sort of, shall we say, non-alternative forum, uh, most people look entirely blankly at this. And yet, that's a strange thing, because this was headline news uh, only a year or so back. And for those that don't know what this is, this appeared in the skies over Norway. Uh, and it's a real image. It's not a fake image. It was seen by thousands of people around Norway. And indeed, there's some very good videos on the internet you'll find. Here's another image showing you this incredible swirl in the sky. So uh, immediately there was speculation. You know, was this an extraterrestrial intervention? Was it some strange kind of natural phenomenon? Uh, or, as others said, was it nothing more than a missile going wrong? Because that's what the newspaper you consider, nothing to retain in our memories, and therefore people forget these strange things going on. So when you look around you, you find lots of mysteries and cover-ups, and I'm just going to go through a few very obvious standard ones here to begin with. And given that we are here in Wiltshire, I thought I couldn't really not just briefly say something about these things. Now, I've been involved over the years, as many of you will know, with research in crop circles. And I'm a little bit tired with people that say they're all man-made and we know they're man-made. Because the minute they say they know they're man-made, you say, I'm looking forward to the evidence. And guess what? That evidence never arrives. Are some man-made? Of course. Are many man-made? Very likely. Are all man-made? Every single crop formation that ever was, are they all man-made? Probably not, when you look at the evidence. And that's the problem. When people say, we know they're all man-made, funnily enough, they will never deliver you the evidence showing that. And yet, we have, in some cases, eyewitness accounts, light seen coming down into the fields, these incredible geometrical formations occurring within seconds in front of some people's eyes. We have biological anomalies occurring inside the plants in some of these formations. There are astonishing mathematical qualities, and yet, then when you see a man-made demonstration made for the TV or whatever, they can be quite good, but so often they lack the sophistication. Now, I know there's some of you here today who will be saying, this is nonsense. I know they're all man-made. Well, if that's the case, I'm looking forward to meeting you afterwards. Please deliver all the evidence and then the debate can end. Until that moment happens, the debate will not end. But you see, what's happened is, again, that the... <laughs> Thank you very much. Can you hear me? That's a good start, isn't it? OK. Well, I understand that you've had a lot of uh, different subjects this weekend. And what I'd like to try to do uh, in this short hour we have ahead of us is try to pull some of the threads together. Because you tend to hear about, you know, this mystery or that mystery, and uh, it becomes hard to get a context on it. And uh, what I want to try to do is to show you today um, how some of these uh, things link together. And I'm very aware also that uh, yesterday you had a presentation from uh, Nick, Nick Pope who's a very nice chap, but uh, as the slogan goes, I don't agree with Nick. <laughs> because Nick certainly has a view, which is of course entirely entitled to, that uh, you know, essentially conspiracy theories and uh, cover-ups don't really exist. Um, well, it would obviously be silly to say that everything's a conspiracy, uh, but equally, I think it's equally ridiculous to say that nothing is a conspiracy. And that very word, conspiracy theory, um, it's used as a term of abuse today. 
But in truth, let me be honest with you, I am by definition a conspiracy theorist. Uh, I spend a lot of time theorizing over conspiracies. So we need to get over that. In the same way that many centuries ago, the Quakers uh, ad adopted a word that was a term of abuse. Quaker was an abusive term. They thought, hey, hang on, if we use that term, it diffuses what people are trying to do. So likewise, hey, if somebody calls me a conspiracy theorist, so be it, because I suppose that's what I am. So let's start pulling the threads together. We heard a lot this morning about ancient mysteries. And you heard from Marcus about the mysteries of Egypt, and you heard more from Robert uh, later on, trying to look at the symbolism of what it is about these ancient cultures that still comes back to us today in the modern world. And we'll have something to say about that a little bit later on. But I'm starting here with an image of the pyramids because they're a very good example of something that we get used to. And as Marcus pointed out to you this morning, uh, the reality is we do not really understand how these things were built, why they were built, uh, and all of these many, many questions. And yet, isn't it remarkable that you put on the TV or the radio, and there are academics, pundits, telling you exactly when they were made, exactly why they were made, and you know how they were made. And the how, if you just take that as one example, uh, usually involves huge ramps, ramps almost as big as the pyramids themselves, with people hauling up these gigantic blocks. But, as I think was demonstrated to you this morning, the idea that that's how all of them were made really does not fit the facts. Uh, and there must have been some other explanation involved. And yet, as soon as you challenge, you challenge the standard world of Egyptology, and you are immediately classified as a pyramidiot. You know, that word they like to use. And that's, of course, not fair. And even when a French engineer, for instance, put forward the very reasonable alternative explanation that maybe uh, 